Exodus 15, beginning at verse 20, reading through verse 27. And I will put it on the screen for those in the house of God today. And the word of the Lord reads from the King James text. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand. And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them saying, excuse me, and Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which, when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam, where there were twelve wells of water, and threescore and ten palm trees, and they camped there by the waters. Hallelujah. Amen. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, let's go to the Lord once again in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for the wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel in the house of God today. There is no greater truth that the people of God can celebrate and rejoice in today than that which we sang. It's all in Him. It's all in Him. The fullness of the Godhead. It's all in Him. Master, today we celebrate your identity. We celebrate that our Christ, the Messiah, was none other than Jehovah God Almighty, manifest in human form, that He might reveal unto us the very personage and the very nature and personality of the God we serve. Lord, you revealed yourself as a man of compassion, a man of love, a man of wisdom, a man of grace. And we understand today, God, that you are a God of wisdom, a God of love, a God of compassion, and a God of grace. And we love you and we thank you for it. As the word of God would go forth, I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost, Lord. Oh God, today there are no feet made of weaker clay than my own. Master, today I recognize, oh God, that for a man, a woman, anyone to be called to ministry, to, to break the bread of life for the benefit of your people, is called to a mighty, powerful, wonderful task. And there is great responsibility associated today, God, with this, with this calling. And I ask God that you would anoint me in such a way that the hearer would understand that that which they hear is a word from the Lord and not merely the opinions or thoughts of men. Oh, Master, let today every word I speak ride upon the wings of love. Touch the heart of every hearer. Encourage, inspire, uplift today. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. 
I've had people tune into our services. Now I'm going to have to go ahead and take my jacket off today. For some reason, I am just burning up up here. Uh, it's been hot here in Texas. We've been going through something of a heat spell. We've got the AC on here, but this is our sunroom, and a lot of sun hits the windows, and it heats the room right up. So I hope you'll pardon me for stripping my jacket off. Amen. I've had people comment over the years to me that they recognized our church was Pentecostal, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized the moment they saw in our worship that the preacher picked up a tambourine. Amen. The minute they saw a timbrel, if ever there has been an identifying factor in a spirit filled, Holy Ghost baptized, tongue talking church, it is the presence of one of these. Amen. A lot of churches you go to, they view the tambourine as being a little too obnoxious an instrument. After all, it makes a loud sound. It makes a clanging sound. And it is, it, it, you know, when you hear a tambourine in music, you know it's a tambourine or you know it's a timbrel. In the Word of God, they speak of tambourines, but they use the word timbrel. We would say that a tambourine is an instrument like I was holding with a head on it. It has an animal skin head on it. And uh, a timbrel is one without the head. It just has the little clinging, uh, clinging metal pieces. But in the Word of God, the tambourine is spoken of as an instrument of praise and celebration. Whenever something happens in the Word of God, read your Bible, whenever something happens, not even just in the church, not even just for the people of God, but even in the world, even uh, people who didn't know God, when something good would happen and they wanted to celebrate, they break out their tambourines. They pull out the tambourine and they begin to play the tambourine. And with that, they begin to dance and they begin to celebrate. You know, when we get happy in this life. Of course, Pentecostal folks don't do it because of the rules and regulations that are in place. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But in most instances when people are happy and people are excited and people want to celebrate, they begin to dance. Amen. Oh, I'm going to tell you, uh, when something good happens, when Tommy and I saw the film uh, uh, Downton Abbey yesterday, and I love that series, and we love that program, and I had to see the film as fast as I could get there to see how everything was going to go. And uh, But during the course of the series, there's one place where... One of the servants has been accused of a crime and he's been in jail and he's been in prison for a period of time and they've been working to try to get him out. And long story short, they finally get him out. And the, the Lord of the home of Downton Abbey and his family, they come down into the servants' quarters to greet this man and to welcome him home. And there, it's, really it's like one big extended family, even though you have those who serve and those who are being served. And he is so thrilled that his servant has been released from prison that he tells his butler to get some of the best wine they have and break it out. We're going to do some celebrating. And he literally said, you know, get four bottles. He wasn't being cheap with it. He wasn't being, uh, you know, uh, just break out one bottle and, you know, we'll call it a day. No, he was being generous and, you know, and they go down to the servants' quarters and, and they're so excited over the news that this man's been let out of prison and that he's home finally that they break out the victrola and they put on a record and they begin to play music and the couples begin to dance and people begin to dance in celebration. 
Dancing has always been a sign of celebration and excitement. And the timbrel has always been an instrument of celebration and excitement in the Word of God. Whenever an occasion took place which called for celebration and rejoicing, someone would reach for the tambourine. Hallelujah. My title of my message today is Grab Your Tambourine. God's people are called upon in the Word of God to worship the Lord with the timbrel and with the dance. If there is any instrument that is specifically called for in the Word of God, it is the timbrel, the tambourine. Now the scriptures speak of a number of instruments. It speaks of harps, it speaks of trumpets, you know, it speaks of cymbals. What's funny is, it doesn't say one word about drums. Now, I could get real legalistic here, and I could get real picky about some things, but I'm going to tell you a little secret. Drums are generally associated with uh, negative spirits and negative things. When somebody's trying to conjure up the dead or they're trying to create zombies, they generally use a drum. Am I telling the truth? It's the truth. Uh, in ancient days, drums were used for lower activities. Well, it's kind of interesting because drums have a lower tone or a lower pitch to them. Unless, of course, you're talking about a snare drum, which has a little bit higher a pitch. But drums have a very low rumbling sound to them. They keep the beat like the tambourine does, but they do it, you know, at a very low uh, level. But tambourines are not a low level instrument. The timbrel, the tambourine is loud. I don't have to do a whole lot, and I'm making a whole lot of noise. Amen. I want to tell you a little secret from the vantage point of spiritual warfare. I'll talk to you a little bit about spiritual warfare today. From the vantage point of spiritual warfare, the Bible says that Satan is the prince and power of the air. I believe one of the reasons that God calls for instruments to be used that generate a high pitch and a high sound is because it disturbs the airways. Hallelujah. Or it gets the environment to be disturbed. It's loud. It's obnoxious, if you please. But I'm going to tell you, the enemy doesn't like it. It disturbs him when there is a loud sound that is being sounded in praise and celebration of our God. He doesn't like that. There are often times when I go into a home or I go to someone who's dealing with spiritual forces uh, in their home to perform an expulsion or even in instances where someone may be wrestling with demonic possession position or, or uh, oppression and I will bring my tambourine hallelujah and I'll walk through that house glory, glory and I'll be worshiping the Lord and I'll be praying and talking to Jesus but I'm disturbing the airwaves hallelujah oh devil I'm gonna fill every inch of this room with praises to my God I'm gonna fill every inch of the air with worship of my God hallelujah I make sure that the enemy knows he hasn't got a corner he hasn't got a shadow where he can hide and escape from the sounds of worship hallelujah in 2 Samuel chapter, get my glasses on so I'm not pointing you in the wrong direction. I would have been. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. The word of the Lord said, And they brought it, meaning the Ark of the Covenant, out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the Ark of God, 
and the Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. In 1 Chronicles 13, 7 and 8, we read of the same occasion. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab. And Uzzah and Ahio drave the cart. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might and with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals, and with trumpets. Psalm 68, 24 through 26. They have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings of my God, my King, in the sanctuary. The singers went before the players on instruments, followed after. Among them were the damsels playing with timbrels. Bless ye God in the congregations, even the Lord, from the foundation of Israel. In Psalm 81, verses 1 and 2, Sing aloud unto God our strength, and make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Take a psalm, and bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp, with the psaltery. In Psalm 149, verses 2 and 3, Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and the harp. Psalm 150 verses 3 and through 5. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high sounding cymbals. Too many people worship the Lord as though it were a duty or an act of labor. They put no effort nor energy into worship. Whereas we have been called to enter into joyful and exuberant celebration when we worship our God. Deuteronomy 6, 3 through 6 Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God thy, of thy fathers hath promised thee. In the land that floweth with milk and honey, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. In Matthew 22, we've read, of a lawyer who comes and asks the Lord, what is the greatest commandment? Matthew 22, 36 through 38. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Meaning, which is the first or the greatest commandment? Verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. No passion is observable without it being physically 
expressed. You know, when you see a couple that are really passionate about one another, you usually are able to discern that because there's some physical expression. You know, you see an old couple, both of them look like they're in their 80s, and bless their hearts, they're walking, and they're hand in hand, they're holding hands, and their little hand is shaking as they hold one another's hand. But isn't it sweet to see that, amen, that physical expression. Or sometimes you'll see a fella looking, I, I think I shared a video on, on Facebook this week, I thought it was so sweet. It was a compilation of young men and the expression, the reaction they had as they saw their bride coming down the aisle for the first time. And the first glimpse they had of their beautiful bride, all adorned in her white dress, you know. And some of these young men, bless their hearts, there'd be such an expression come over their face. You could just tell they were just pleased as punch. They were just thrilled out of their mind to see that beautiful girl, at least in their eyes, that she's beautiful. I can't say they're always beautiful in my eyes, but to the groom, she's beautiful. And there'd be an expression, some of them just broke out in tears, and some of them, bless their hearts, they, they just uh, had such a look come over their face, you could just tell they were thrilled, but there was a physical expression. And you could feel the passion, you could feel the love that this young man had for that woman by reason of his physical expression. Am I telling the truth today? Oh, but watch people worship God in church sometimes. And boy, Heidi, I'm going to tell you, if, if you're going to tell how much they love God, if you're going to get any sense of their passion for the Lord, say passion for the Lord, I'm a preacher, that sounds a little overdone to me. No, no, the Word of God said we're to love Him with all our mind and with all our heart and with all our soul. Listen, and with all our might. What does that mean? That means the Lord wants us to express that love and that devotion through passionate expression. That's why the Word of God says to praise Him with the timbrel and the harp and the dance. Because all of these things take effort. I'm going to tell you, in my battles with cancer and various issues that I've had to wrestle with over the last several years, there have been any number of times that I've been up here trying to lead the worship and singing. And there have been any number of times when Tommy knows that I was so tired and so worn out and so fizzled out and so energyless that, honey, I, I literally, there were, there were many times I had to put my hand on the pulpit like this to hold myself up. But you know what? We get to sing in certain songs. And all of a sudden, the spirit inside me begin to stir. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you, I begin to feel the Holy Ghost. And I reach for that tambourine. Because I don't care how tired I am. I don't care how wore out I am. I've got to play my tambourine. Hallelujah. This is an instrument of worship. This is an instrument of praise. This is an instrument of celebration. I could sit here and I could carry on about how sick I feel and how bad I feel and how weak I feel. But you know what? I'm still here, aren't I? Hallelujah. So there is something to celebrate. There is something to rejoice in. There is something I can give God praise over. I'm here to tell you today. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care how bad things look. I don't care how bleak things may be. There is something that you can worship God for. There is something today that is worthy of your reaching for your tambourine. Hallelujah. The biggest problem is too many of us focus on what's ahead of us instead of focusing on what's behind us. Miriam 
and the women of Israel picked up their tambourines in our primary text today in Exodus 15 they picked up their tambourines and they begin to play and they begin to celebrate why because God had brought them through the Red Sea and he had buried their enemies beneath the water of the Red Sea hallelujah to God they weren't thinking about the journey that lie ahead they weren't focused on the troubles that were yet to come they weren't thinking about they didn't realize they didn't know for the next three days there'd be no source of water from which they'd be able to drink. But in the here and now, in this moment, in this moment, oh, I'm here to tell you, in this moment, God was worthy of praise. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, there's a reason why we go to church. There's a reason why we go to the house of God. There's a reason why we don't sit at home and soak and bask in our misery. But as children of God, we go into the house of God. Come on, tell you, I may not have anything to celebrate at the moment, but chances are somebody in the church does. Mm -hmm. Somebody in the church is going to have a testimony that's going to lift me up. The preacher is going to have a message that's going to encourage me and inspire me. Hallelujah. In the house of God, the Holy Ghost is going to touch my spirit and help me to remember what's behind me, what God has done for me, where the Lord has led me, where the Lord has brought me to. I may not be in Canaan land yet, but glory to God, I'm a whole lot closer than I was yesterday. Yesterday. That's right. Mm -hmm. The biggest obstacle the children of Israel would face in their journey to Canaan was now behind them. Crossing the Red Sea was the biggest obstacle they would ever face. For one thing, it was a natural enemy. Say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is they weren't fighting a war against other human beings. They weren't trying to conquer a city or conquer some community somewhere. No, 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 no. They were fighting nature. They were powerless against nature. How many times have we stood there? I grew up in New England. I don't know how many times I stood there and watched hurricanes come flying through. And I mean to tell you, you'd be standing there. Of course, you'd have to stand away from the windows and all that. But you'd be where you could kind of look through that window and you'd watch that wind bend in trees. I mean, further than that tree looked like it could bend. And you'd be watching the, the storm just uh, blow and watching the rains fall, watching the thunder and the lightning. How many times here in Texas have we watched the winds blow and the hail fall? And we recognize how powerless we are when it comes to battling nature. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Nature can be a powerful enemy. Nature is a very powerful enemy because there's no way in the world we can combat it. We have to simply endure it. Am I telling the truth? The children of Israel came up against a natural obstacle, a body of water. There was nothing in the universe they could. They couldn't fight harder. They couldn't shoot better. They couldn't do anything that was going to cause them to be able to cross that body of water. It would take God. Hallelujah. And God stepped in. How many times in your life have you faced an obstacle and it was too big for you? There wasn't anything within your ability. There was nothing within your power to be able to combat that obstacle. It was something that was going to require God and God alone. Hallelujah. And how many times did God come through? Pick up your tambourine. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, I come to church sometimes. I don't care. I can, be feel, I can feel so sick. I can feel so bad. My body can be so worn out. And they'll start singing this song. Look what the Lord hath done. Look what the Lord hath done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. I'm going to praise His name. 
He's always just the same. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to praise him. Look what the Lord has done. And I don't care what I felt like coming into the church. I got to tell you, it's time to reach for my tambourine. Hallelujah. Oh! I may have a ways to go ahead of me. I may not be where I want to be or be where I need to be or be where I'd like to be. But that song reminds me, He healed my body. Hallelujah. He has healed my body. He has touched my mind. He has saved me just in time. How many times ought I to have been dead? But God stepped in. How many times did the doctor shake their head and say, we can do nothing more? He'll be gone within 24 hours. And God stepped in. You see, when you come into the house of God and we begin to sing the songs of praise, you're reminded sometimes of those Red Sea experiences. Hallelujah. You're reminded sometimes of those things that are behind you. That God, and I'm going to tell you something. Ain't nothing in the world help you to believe God for tomorrow's trouble like remembering yesterday's victory. Amen. We sing the song, He'll do it again. He can do it again. Glory to God, if you just take a look at where you are now and where you have been. Hasn't He always come through for you? He's the same now as then. You may not know how, you may not know when, but He'll do it again. Glory to God. Oh, children, I'm going to tell you, there's a reason I go to church. There's a reason I worship the Lord corporately in fellowship and in communion with other believers because without fail, when I come into this place, I find a reason to pick up my tambourine. I told you before, no passion is observable without physical expression. Go to an NFL game and see if the fans are not passionate. See if they don't get loud. See if they're not physically expressive. Tommy and I went one time. His bank allowed us tickets to a hockey game here. I'm not a hockey follower. I could care less about hockey, to be honest with you. Doesn't mean a whole lot to me. But we went to a Dallas Stars game over here at the American Airlines Center. And they had their own box there. And we were able to be up in this fancy schmancy box, you know. It was quite an experience. I was there for the experience of the box. I could have cared less about the game. But boy, I'm going to tell you what. I could be sitting at the back of the box not even paying attention to what's going on on the ice. And I guarantee I knew something good was happening because I could hear it. I could hear the people screaming and shouting and carrying on and clapping and applauding and all this noise going on. People with noisy, what are those little things, you know, wah, that they hold the button down and makes a big honking noise, you know. And I mean, they're, oh, there was such a racket. And they got a guy up on an organ and ba 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 da ba ba da ba ba da building up people's emotion and getting them all excited. My Lord, you could feel the energy. We got churches call themselves Christian churches. You go there and their worship, it's like a funeral. Mm -hmm. Oh, God forbid, don't tap your foot. I know one Baptist preacher said one time, if you can tap your foot to a song, then it's a song that ought not to be played in the church. How stupid. See what I mean about just saying things the way I feel it? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. The Word of God calls for demonstrative worship. It calls for active worship. It calls for passionate worship and physical worship. It calls for us to love the Lord our God with all our might. I remember... Some years ago, and I'm sure most of you remember when actor Tom Cruise was on the Oprah Winfrey show some years ago. And he was talking about, 
I believe it was Katie Holmes, who at the time anyway was his latest love interest. And boy, he got a lot of publicity. He got a lot of press. Because boy, he just jumped up and was jumping around talking about how much he loved her and how crazy he was. And he jumped up on the couch that Oprah was sitting with him on, you know. And boy, I mean to tell you people, boy, what a nut. What a crazy, foolish nut. But you know, you gotta, you got to be pretty crazy about somebody to get that physical about him. Am I telling the truth? He, he must have had feelings for the girl because he sure was passionate in his expression, wasn't he? Amen. He didn't just sit there and say, oh, I love her so much, you just can't even begin to know how much I love her. I am so crazy about her. She is just the best person in the world. I've never felt the way I felt about, about her. I've never felt this way about anybody else. Now, if somebody sat there and did all that, how how much would you believe them? We got people say, oh, I love the Lord. I thank God for all the things He's done. I thank God for the things He's brought into my life. But when they come into church to worship, they fold their hands. If I don't have my tambourine, I guarantee I'm clapping. Because the Word of God also calls us to clap our hands. Psalm 47, Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord most high is terrible. The word terrible there literally translates awe-inspiring. He is a great king over all the earth. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. If, I'm not, if I don't have a tambourine, Tommy, that I can use to worship the Lord with, I got an instrument built in that God gave me at birth, and I'll start clapping my hands. And you know what? It doesn't matter to me no kind of way. If the person in the pew next to me is clapping, I could care less. If the guy down a couple of pews from me is clapping, I could care less. If y'all want to sit there and you want to worship God in a manner that doesn't even begin to say, that you're passionate and that you genuinely love Him in a way that, that runs deep in your soul. If you want to worship God like some old dead, dried up sardine, have a party. I don't care, but I'm going to worship Him with all my might. Hallelujah. I'm going to worship Him with all my energy and all my strength. And if I'm able to, I'm going to reach for my temporal. Hallelujah. I'm going to reach for my tambourine. When we go to visit churches a lot of time, years ago, especially back in the day when I was evangelizing, if I went to visit a church, I brought my tambourine with me, honey. I'm telling you what, because I wanted to have that. I wanted to be able to contribute. I remember I began to attend a Pentecostal church in East Texas years ago, and Brother Allen, the pastor, uh, loved me playing my tambourine. See, back in the day, I could play a lot more. Nowadays, I, I just basically keep a beat. That's, and I know that. I'm, I'm not goofy. I know. But I know how to play a tambourine if I really want to play it. And I want to play it hard and I want to play it fast. I can play me a tambourine with a head on it, you know. But uh, I used to play it, and it was so funny because the kids in the church would line up in this pew behind me, literally, and they loved to watch me play my tambourine. I, I don't know, I, it's just the way I played it, you know, got them excited. They liked watching me play my tambourine. And those kids would line up and they all be sitting there with big grins on their face watching me beat on my tambourine, you know. And Brother Allen said, Brother Chuck, why don't you come up and sit in the the area with the rest of the orchestra, the rest of the people. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not playing this for them. I'm not playing this to, I'm not even playing it to add to the music per se. I, this is me worshiping God, and I worship God right here in my seat. I don't need to carry it up there. He said, I wish you would because I love, he said, let me tell you, the pianist has told me that you keep an incredible beat. He said, you keep things timed just perfect. He said, it would really help everybody if you could play them. So finally, I, I agreed and I moved up to where the orchestra was, you know, and I played my tambourine up there, but I wasn't trying to be seen. I wasn't trying to be anything. I, that was just me worshiping God. That, that's just how I celebrated Jesus. 
people wonder why we Pentecostal folks shout. They wonder why we Pentecostal people cry. They wonder why we Pentecostal people clap our hands. Why we dance and why we celebrate and why we rejoice the way we do. My father had a sister, bless her heart, she's passed away now, my aunt Susan. And many years ago I'd gone, she had invited me to come and be in uh, Thanksgiving with her and her husband and kids. And uh, she was living in my father's house. And uh, they were renting from my dad. And she invited me to come and I went and she was talking to me and she said, you know, she said, when I was a kid, your mother used to take us sometimes to church with you, with your grandmother and her family. She said, and they took us to Brother Talbot's church up there in Wolcott. Brother Tatlock had an old-timey, Holy Ghost-filled Pentecostal church. Man, I'm going to tell you, them women just shout their hair down. They dance all over the church. They run the aisles. I mean, you talk about worship. It was expressive. It was physical. It was passionate. And my Aunt Susan said, well, you know something? She said, my husband and I, we go to church twice a year. She said, we're not... I can't say we go regularly. So we go twice a year. So we go on Easter and we go on Christmas, she said. And I got to tell you, she said, I wouldn't go to any other kind of church but a Pentecostal church. She said, you couldn't get me to go to any other kind of church but a Pentecostal church. It's my dad's sister. They weren't, they weren't raised in church. They weren't exposed to church except for my mother and my grandmother inviting them and bringing them as kids to Brother Tatlock's Pentecostal Church in Wolcott, Connecticut. She said, I wouldn't go. She said, my husband and I go to a Pentecostal church. Just so happens his daughter from his first marriage was Pentecostal and she attended a United Pentecostal Church up in Connecticut there. And she said, that's where we go. She said, because I'm going to tell you something. She said, ever since I was a kid, she said, I, there is something about the way Pentecostal people worship. She said, it is so real. It is so real. And it is so sincere. She said, there is something about the way those people worship. She said, you know, <laughs> she said, you just know they believe what they preach. What's sad is I remember as a kid growing up, our little church that I grew up in, we had a little wood frame building in Naugatuck, Connecticut. Little small wood frame building. Only held about probably a hundred people or maybe a little over a hundred people. We had these, these old uh, stained glass windows on the side of the building. They weren't fancy stained glass. They were literally just like different colored glass squares, you know, in the panels. I don't know how many times, Tommy, growing up, a drunkard stumbled into our church and found a seat at the back of the sanctuary. And later they'd say, I heard the singing. And I heard the tambourine. And I heard this boisterous, loud, celebratory sound coming from this place. And I just had to come in. I just had to come in. Oh, I'm telling you folks, is our worship today, is it worship that invites the unbeliever to come and see what we're so happy about? Is our worship today so passionate and so full of joy and so expressive that those who've never been in church, who have never been exposed to church, like my Aunt Susan, can sit back and observe and look and, and think to themselves, my God, these people must really believe what they preach. They must really believe what they talk. I remember my mother worked at a bank many, many years ago. She was in the proofing department where checks went through, you know, 
and they'd have to clear the checks, you know, this way back before everything was computerized and all that. She worked with a young lady named Pam. Pam was a Roman Catholic girl. She'd come from an Italian family. And one day my mom invited her to come to church with us, and Pam said, yeah, I'll come. See, that's how we used to win souls back in the day. We invited people to church. We didn't go door to door. We didn't go preaching at them in the street. We didn't yell and scream at them and holler at them. We'd invite them to come. Just come. You know, if they, if they believed, they believed. If they didn't, they didn't. It's up to them. But we'd expose them to the preached Word of God because the Bible said it is the foolishness of preaching that God chose to save them that are lost. See, God's the one who designed the system, not us. You get somebody under the anointed preached word of God and let me tell you something, God can work on their heart and God can speak to them and they can find faith to believe the Lord, to obey the gospel. So all we try to do is get them to the right place so they can feel the anointing and they can hear the message and then it's up to them to receive it or reject it. Well, Pam was going to come one Sunday morning. <laughs> I'll never forget it so long as I live. And my mother and myself, I don't know, I don't know what was going on in our head, but we decided that it probably wouldn't be a great thing if we had one of those wrung out, drug out services, you know, where people were shouting and running and falling out in the aisles. And, you know, it'd probably be better, Lord. We know better, Lord. Probably be better if we just had us a nice quiet service today, Lord. So please give us a nice quiet service. This little Catholic girl's coming, and we sure don't want to scare her to death. Well, Pam come to church that day, and she said in the service, and let me tell you what happened. God ignored every word we prayed. And holy mackerel, we had us a Holy Ghost blowout. I mean to tell you, we had we had about every everything you could ever dream of happening happening that day. We had tongues with interpretation. We had prophecy. We had a move of the Holy Ghost. People falling out in the aisles. I mean, honey, we just had church all over the place. And of course, my mother and I are looking at each other horrified. We're looking at each other terrified. And I will never, for a, if I live to be a thousand, I will never forget my aunt. Uh, she became my aunt. She wound up meeting my uncle and marrying my uncle. But I'll never forget Pam that day coming out of that church. And she said to me, that was beautiful. That was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I have never seen a church service like that in my life. That was beautiful. Oh, children, I want to tell you today, God knows what He's doing. God knows what He's doing. On the day of Pentecost, they were able to get the entire city's attention because 120 people in one place at one time experienced the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And they had to be doing something. They had to be acting awkward. They had to be acting strange. Something more than simply preaching in a variety of tongues and a variety of languages. Something more than that had to be going on because the observers thought they were drunk. They thought they were bombed. I'll tell you, you get into a good Holy Ghost service sometime, you'll think those people are plastered out of their mind the way they'll act. I want to tell you, if you're not accustomed to Pentecost, you don't understand how Pentecost works. When you see somebody get in touch and they start acting funny and they start moving funny, let me. God is not grabbing them and making them do all these things. That's how, how that works. They're feeling something in their spirit. The Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, is ministering to their spirit. And it's kind of like grabbing a hold of an electric wire. You're going to react to it some kind of way. Not everybody reacts to what they're feeling the same way. Some people, Sister Gillum, bless her heart, she used to get to nodding her head. She'd bob her head. You'd see her praying. She'd be, Lord Jesus, but she'd be praying. All of a sudden, she'd get to feeling the Holy Ghost, and you'd see her start doing this. 
And then all of a sudden it'd be blah, 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 and all of a sudden it'd be blah, 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 and boy, I mean, her head just be bobbing up and down. That was her reaction. That's how she responded. When she get to feeling that move of God in her heart. Other people, you know, I, I had a lady in my first church, bless her heart, June. I've told you about June before. But bless her heart, June said to me one time, she said, oh, pastor, I want to get zapped. I said, you want to get what? She said, I want to get zapped. I said, what in the world are you talking about? She said, sometimes when the Holy Ghost touches you and you dip and you, what you know, she said, I just want the Lord to zap me like <laughs> he zaps you. I said, honey, if the Lord touched you the way he's touching me, you might have an altogether different react. You may react to it different. That's just how my body reacts to what I'm feeling, you know. I said, you may react entirely different. <sighs> Passion is expressed physically. That's why when Tom Cruise acted as he did over Katie Holmes, you know, it was an expression of the love and the passion that he claimed to feel for her. A physical expression of his love. Most looked at him as though he were crazy, but his love for his woman was passionate and passionately expressed. In 2 Samuel 6, 14 through 23, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. Gee, isn't that interesting that the word would be used here with all his might? Isn't that what we're told to love the Lord with all our might? David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephah. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Mike, uh, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings unto the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well to the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh or meat and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed, every one to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, sarcastically, I might add, how glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids and of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. And David said unto Michal, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. And I will yet be more vile than thus and will be base in mine own sight. And of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor." Therefore Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. I want to tell you something, honey. God appreciates when we reach for our tambourine. Hallelujah. God appreciates when we put passion and effort and energy into our worship. Michal criticized her husband. She thought he looked foolish carrying on as he had carried on. After all, you're the king, you know, you're supposed to act all uppity and you're supposed to act just a certain way. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I was before the Lord. That was between me and God. I'm going to tell you, if I shout and dance, if I get happy in the Holy Ghost in church and you don't like it, well, fooey on you. That's your problem. It's not mine. 
Because everything I do, I do before the Lord. I believe God's real. I'm going to tell you something. God's as real to me as the nose on my face. I'm going to tell you. I don't get, if you don't get why I worship the way I worship, well, I'll tell you what. I'm sorry. God is real to me. People can look at that, oh, look at that fool. There ain't no God. There ain't no such thing as God. I don't care what you believe about it. I know what I believe. I know what I've experienced. I know what the Lord has done for me. Hallelujah. I know how many Red Sea experiences I've got behind me. And honey, when I reach for my tambourine, if you think I'm making a fool out of myself, well, so be it. That's all well and good for you. But I'm going to reach for that tambourine because I've got something to celebrate. The Word of God declares in Psalm 98, 4 and 5, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a psalm. Psalm 33 and 3 declares, Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. Acts 2, 12 through 16. I was talking about it a moment ago, the day of Pentecost. The people of God in the upper room, 120 or so, received the gift of the Holy Ghost and they poured out into the streets and they must have been acting some kind of way because this is the response, the reaction they got. And they were all amazed and were in doubt. This is the people observing the believers who had just been filled with the Holy Ghost. They were all amazed and were in doubt saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, which would be about nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Hallelujah. He said, honey, this is the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Because Joel said, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Hallelujah. He said, no, this is the manifestation. Oh, y'all think they're drunk? They're not drunk. This is the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I want to tell you, God's looking for people today who can worship Him. God's looking for people today who can love Him and love Him passionately and worship Him passionately, not passively. The Word of God tells us that God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must, Jesus said, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. See, that's the thing about us spirit-filled people. We worship from a deeper place. We're, it's not just, we're not just worshiping God from our head. We're not just worshiping the Lord from... Our mind, or we're not just worshiping the God with worshiping the Lord with our flesh, but no, our worship is born in our spirit. And when you're full of the Holy Ghost, I'm gonna tell you, God, that spirit within you, the spirit of God touches your spirit and it it ignites a fire. You know, even in the old testament, the prophet Jeremiah said, It's like fire shut up in my bones. And it's like having a nuclear explosion in your breast at times because the Holy Ghost will remind you about something or the Spirit of the Lord will suddenly make a truth come to life for you, something you've been struggling with, something you've been troubled by. And all of a sudden the Lord will just bring a certain truth to life in your mind and in your spirit. And all of a sudden you find yourself dancing and shouting and rejoicing and getting happy. Oh, you know, the guy next to you doesn't understand why. You know why? Because it ain't his. It's between you and God. It's like David. This between me and the Lord. It doesn't have nothing to do with you. Hallelujah. 
When you see people worshiping the way we folks worship, every individual is having their own experience. Every person in the room is having is being touched by the Lord and ministered to by the Holy Ghost in their own way. But I want to tell you today, folks, you've got some Red Seas behind you. You know that God has delivered for you and the Lord has come through for you in the past. You may have a ways to go. You may have obstacles that you'll face tomorrow. But you know what? When you come upon tomorrow's obstacles, God's going to meet that need as well. When they came upon the bitter waters, did, not, did the Lord not command Moses to throw this tree down into the water? And because of his obedience, his act of faith, God caused the waters to become sweet. Hallelujah. See, you can shout today. You can dance today. You can grab your tambourine today. Because, honey, as sure as I'm alive, God's going to take care of your needs tomorrow as well. Hallelujah. He doesn't lead you through the Red Sea so that you can dehydrate in the wilderness. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? If God has done as much for you as He's done for you to bring you to the place you are now, then you better know that He's going to continue to provide for you until you get where you're going. Hallelujah. Oh, children, I'm here to tell you today, grab your tambourine. Glory to God. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise.